I learned something from you at this conference. Uh, you caused the dime to drop on something that I hadn't put together, which is I had become aware, of course, of the modification of the RNA in the, uh, the RNA-based uh, vaccines, um, a substitution of a nucleotide. But when I became aware that it had happened, I assumed that that had been uh, information that was available all along and that I had somehow overlooked it. That's not right, is it? Um, so, uh, so you're speaking of the incorporation of pseudouridine. Yep. And uh, just for the audience, so we're all kind of on the same page. Yeah. This to, to kind of comprehend this without going too deep into the weeds. Uh, the process that this synthetic RNA is by which it's manufactured is that um, a plasma DNA, a circular DNA is manufactured in a bacteria where you can make large quantities of it. And it has encoded in it the sequences necessary to tell a particular enzyme, start here and go there and uh, make an RNA based on this DNA template. Okay, and the enzyme that does that is T7 RNA polymerase. Um, and when it does that, it has to grab the components, the nucleotides, as you mentioned, out of a solution. The enzyme, as it proceeds along the DNA track to make this uh, be uh, like a string of pearls kind of product that is the RNA that comes off of that polymerase, uh, the polymerase enzyme has to grab these molecules out of solution. And the mo molecular mix is relatively homogeneous, but somewhat random. Um, and uh, the way it's done is in the tube, metaphorically, of course, this is happening in a larger volume now. In the tube, you add A, U, G, and C, these four fundamental components, as opposed to the digital world that we're familiar with, which only has two, a zero, and a one. In nucleic acids, there's four components, A, U, G, C, or A, T, G, C, and DNA, just to get the fundamentals out. And um, in natural RNA, uh, the um, there is a uh, uracil or uridine base that is one of these four. It's the U, A, U, G, C, that goes into the RNA. And it is uh, polymerized in the cell in the same kind of process. Uh, and then in the cell, there's a specific enzyme that will act at specific points in that RNA. And we're still learning that. We're learning about what makes that enzyme decide to change that particular uridine to a pseudouridine. It's a chemical modification catalyzed by an enzyme, and it's very precisely controlled. And very precisely controlled in, in a biological, in a, in a functioning in cell. cell. In a functioning cell. And it's very precisely controlled because the implications of where it does that modification are huge in the biology of that subsequent RNA and what it does, how it gets spliced, which is to say kind of molecularly recombined, um, how long it lasts in the cell. And it also affects um, the, the RNAs apparently influence a lot of pathways involved in your immune response. And so all of these things are regulated and the pseudouridine changes how the RNA folds is a whole bunch of intricate cool stuff if you're an RNA wonk. Um, and the difference is that, number one, we really don't understand how all that works yet. Um, so this is the uh, um, part about uh, um, uh, coming to terms with our own ignorance. Yeah, well, uh, precautionary principle-wise, just so it's a, it's okay. a red flag. And, and so what, what's done in the... Uh, in the uh, synthetic RNA that's produced in a factory uh, that employs this patent of Carrico and Weissman, which is held by UPenn and licensed to uh, BioNTech and to Moderna, is that um, they put um, all of the U's or most of the U's are pseudouridines. Um, 
and they incorporate them randomly throughout the RNA at very high density. Yep. And so what this results in is an RNA that is not natural. It is something different. It's not what would be normally in the cell. And yet physicians were reassured by the pharmaceutical industry that uh, um, the behavior of this artificial RNA in terms of how long it sticks in the cell and its underlying biology was the same as a natural RNA. And this was actively told when physicians asked, uh, you know, typically they would ask the pharmaceutical rep or whatever for information, well, how long does this drug stick around? Which is a normal thing to ask. Okay, we call that pharmacokinetics is the fancy yep. word for it. Um, you know, how long does the drug last in your body before it gets decomposed? One of the fundamental characteristics that is always an analyzed with any new pharmaceutical. Um, those studies actually weren't done. Yep. Uh, nor were the, where does the drug go in your body? The fancy word for that is pharmacodistribution. And how long is it active? That's pharmacokinetics. None of that stuff was done. Um, it was done to a limited extent, but not rigorously. And not looking at this full cascade that the RNA is actually not really the drug. It's sort of the drug. Um, but the active principle is the thing that the RNA makes, the protein, which makes it complex and it really doesn't fit regular vaccine uh, regulatory paradigms. Right. So, so then um, fast forward, uh, Katie well, Carrico um, knew because I'd spoken to her, she called me about a decade after I'd done the, for the initial work and asked for my help. Um, and I said, because she wanted to work on RNA and RNA delivery. And I said, the big problem with the system is that it is incredibly inflammatory. It essentially, giving it common language, it causes pus formation when you inject it into a variety of tissues and uh, pain and swelling and redness, classic signs of inflammation. And, uh, and so, so I said, you know, I told her people that she could talk to and, and she and Drew Weissman, who's a, a Fauci postdoc um, uh, at Penn, um, had the brainstorm that they would take this new biologic finding, pseudouridine, which was known at the time to have some effect on inflammation associated with RNA. And they said, we'll just put a whole lot of pseudouridine in the RNA. And lo and behold, it produced a product that would produce protein for longer and at higher levels um, when it was administered into an animal. And so this was the basis for that patent. Um, Moderna actually didn't want to license it. Uh, Katie is a vice president at BioNTech, so it was always part of the BioNTech uh, um, portfolio. And the, there's another third player in the RNA vaccine space called CureVac which is also in Germany, and they've never used pseudouridine. And actually the, the um, immune responses of their RNA formulations, which are basically the same, except they don't have the pseudouridine, in humans are very similar. Um, but this was the position that was taken by these uh, two scientists who had close ties to NIH. And that is why that pseudouridine is incorporated that way in all of the artificial RNAs that any of us that have taken the RNA vaccines have received. And um, then fast forward to the present, and we have these odd observations about immunosuppression. And then we had this paper come out in Cell in January uh, from this team from Stanford that did the fine needle aspirations. Uh, so they actually pulled cells out of people's bodies. It wasn't in a test tube or in a Petri dish. And they said, how long does this RNA stick around? And it turns out that it doesn't stick around for half an hour, an hour or two hours, which is what the pharma had been telling the physicians. But in fact, it sticks around for at least 60 days. They didn't test beyond that. Right. And furthermore, it produces more protein in your blood, more spike protein of the, remember, the, the, this is one of the things I got fact checked on after our infamous interview, yep. that spike is absolutely not a toxin. The spike that's in the vaccine is not a toxin. That's the, what they claimed. The spike has two main components. S2 that kind of stays in the cell and gets cut from the other part that's extracellular called S1 that circulates and binds to S2 and does all this wonderful stuff. In the vaccine and in the virus, 
The S1 is identical. In the vaccine and the virus, the S2 is almost identical, except for it has two little point mutations, two prolines, which are there that makes the uh, product, when it's expressed, more immunogenic from an antibody standpoint. And I think you, you taught me this. They locked it open. They basically took the scissors and they put a, a weld so that the scissors are locked open. Well, and, we look at it. Yeah. And the reason that they did that was because the outside of the protein naturally accumulates sugars, which is probably an evolved defense of the virus so that Absolutely. it doesn't get spotted. <laughs> and so by locking it open, they expose a part of the protein that the immune system can then see and register. So at the level of, can you make a vaccine that stimulates the immune system? This makes sense. But they took a toxic protein and they locked it open and left it otherwise so that, similar. I, when I said that to you, I got that partially wrong. Okay. And, and I got pushed back from uh, molecular virologists on that. And I had to dive deeper into it and correct that. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. Great. Um, I got it wrong. Uh, um, it was my best understanding at the time uh, that those two proline mutations do alter the immunogenicity, but they don't really lock the... Uh, receptor binding domain pockets open, like I was saying, mm. and now I know that those receptor binding domains. It's a, this this protein that we talk about spike so casually is a fascinating molecule. As all of these viral receptors that have dual functions, they bind and then they also trigger the fusion event that allows the nucleic acid to get into the cell. Um, in the case of of the the um, spike protein, I like to use the metaphor. It's like a treble fish hook. Right, you mm -hmm. understand what a treble hook looks like, sure. and if you think about the barbs on the treble hook, those are akin to the receptor binding domain. And if you think about the part where you tie the knot um, onto the fishing line, that's really S two. That little loop down yeah. there is kind of like S two. So if you've got that metaphor in your mind, then you can imagine each of those barbs are completely flexible; they can rotate. Okay, and that's what the receptor binding domain does. And it, that, those two point mutations alter the conformation of that three treble, three component trimer that is spike mm -hmm. and alter the um, conformational change capability to undergo the conformational change associated with the um, fusion versus prefusion conformation. Remember I said yep. they has this dual function, but so that part is true. Um, it does make it more immunogenic. It does alter the, the, it locks it into the prefusion confirmation. Um, so it can't undergo that change, but it, I was wrong. It does not affect the receptor binding domains, which are floating out there kind of free. And it makes sense from a, I mean, I know you love biology and evolution and biochemistry. And so you can imagine these things have, you know, huge conformational freedom to find their mm -hmm. uh, cognate receptor. So that's, um, thank you for mentioning that, but, but it's this is really in the weeds. Uh